my name is Kitty and behind the camera there that's Jenny. Hello! And we are the naturalist interns here at the University of Guelph Arboretum and we are participating uh, as a part of the Two Rivers Festival this year. We're here to show you some creatures of the Arboretum Creek. Now if you've never been to the Arboretum, Arboretum before or you're not sure what an Arboretum is, I like to describe it as kind of like a museum for trees. So here in our wonderful space, we have things like manicured gardens, we have things like natural habitats, old growth forests, uh, even a nature reserve. But essentially what this place is, it's kind of like a museum for trees. So we have trees from all over, some that are native to Ontario, and some that are from all the way across the world as well. And we have some trees that are uh, native and common, and also some really, really rare things too. So uh, at this space, lots and lots of good things happen. It is a lovely public space for people to enjoy nature. We also do a lot of educational programming here. So we run usually lots of programming for students and adults that visit here and workshops as well. And we also do a lot of research and conservation efforts. For example, we have um, a gene bank for rare woody plants to found here in Ontario. And we do lots of research in conjunction with the University of Guelph as well, pertaining to lots of natural subjects. So we're really, really all over the place, but at its heart, we are all about trees. We love trees and we have lots of different habitats here where trees and other plants can grow. And that attracts a lot of other animals as well. And behind me here, we are have the Arboretum Creek. So that is the special habitat that we are going to explore for today's event for the Two Rivers Festival. Arboretum Creek is a tributary, which means that it is a small stream that runs to Aramosa River. It contributes to Aramosa River. And this water ecosystem and a lot of other aquatic ecosystems are really, really important to our, our world. They do lots and lots of roles for us. For example, they support a, a whole community of different plants and animals. Some animals like fish might spend their entire time or their entire life underwater. Some animals like maybe insects will only spend a part of their life underwater and then part of their life uh, out on land. Some animals maybe uh, will come in and out of the water or some animals just come to a creek like this or aquatic ecosystem like this just to have a little drink or a little bath. And not only that, but a creek like this is really, really important for uh, transporting things like uh, maybe minerals and nutrients as those things get um, eroded from the soil, gets carried down further downstream to another habitat. It can even, even be really, really good for things like seed dispersal. For example, uh, the Ohio buckeye, it is a tree that's native to Ontario and it's also an at-risk species. We have one growing the Arboretum or just over there and these guys, they produce uh, big round fruits and they look kind of funny looking but as a plant, as any plants, they want their fruits to be dispersed far away from the parent plants. So that gives the seeds inside the best chance at growing in a hospitable environment and also to help disperse the genetics from the parent plants. Now for the Ohio Buckeye, their fruit, it's not exactly light so wind can blow at far distances and it's not very appetizing for animals so we don't get squirrels carrying them along but what happens is their fruit is very buoyant and very round as well so they'll fall down from the tree and they'll roll and roll and roll and the idea is that this fruit will roll until it hits the stream maybe just like this and the water it's going to keep this buoyant uh, fruit afloat and carry it downstream until it hits uh, somewhere further downstream that's hospital full for it and then it's going to germinate and grow into a whole new plant. So streams like this can be very very important for seed dispersal as well. Lots of different things. And when we are looking at aquatic ecosystems they can also be really really important sources uh, of uh, fresh water and in some cases it's going to help filter and clean fresh water as well. For example, if we get a fresh water source that has pollutants in it, uh, maybe things like sediments or nitrogenous compounds or uh, any sorts of things, and it passes through a aquatic ecosystem like maybe a wetland, that's really, really important for helping 
filter out those pollutants and help the water that's going to be escaping out of that wetland to be nice and clean for all the plants and animals in our world to enjoy. So lots and lots of aquatic ecosystems are really, really important. And when we want to uh, keep these ecosystems healthy, we can kind of gauge the health of these ecosystems by looking at something called bioindicators. So these are species, uh, it could be animals or plants, that are very, very sensitive to things like pollutants. So that means if an ecosystem like this gets contaminated with pollutants, what happens is those species uh, might change their behavior, uh, they might look different, or they might not even be able to survive at all. So by looking at the presence of these species in the water, we can kind of gauge how healthy that ecosystem is, which is really, really important. Now, that's exactly what we're gonna do today. We're here at Arboretum Creek to kind of take a look at some of the different plants and animals that live in and around this area. And I think a really, really awesome place to start will be right over there. This big tree here is called bald cypress. Now, bald cypress is not a native tree to Ontario. They live further down into the US, but we have planted one uh, here for people to enjoy. And this is a really, really cool tree because it's what we call a deciduous conifer. So when we think of a coniferous tree, we are talking about trees that produce cones. The ones that most people will be familiar with would be things like pine trees or spruce trees because they produce cones. And those trees, they also have nice long needles and they keep their needles all year long. So that means that some people sometimes call them evergreen trees as well because they stay green all year long. When we are talking about deciduous trees, we are talking about trees that lose their leaves in the winter time so they don't keep their leaves all year long like pine trees or spruce trees and usually we can think of deciduous trees like maybe a maple tree or an oak tree and those trees they lose their leaves in the winter but their leaves are really big and wide and flat and that happens because it can help capture sunlight in the summer and in the winter time where those big flat leaves can uh, hurt the tree by accumulating lots of weight from snow then they drop those leaves in the fall to prevent that. So those are called deciduous trees. Now, for a, a tree like the bald cypress, they don't have big, flat, broad leaves like maple trees or oak trees. But you can see some of the leaves coming in there. Look how cute. I love baby leaves. Very, very cute. So you'll notice they have needle-like leaves, kind of like spruce trees and pine trees. But the special thing about this tree is the bald cypress, despite it producing cones like those trees and having needles like those trees, they actually lose their leaves in the fall, just like a maple tree or an oak tree. So that's why we call this tree a deciduous conifer. It lost its leaves uh, in the fall last year and all through the winter, its uh, branches were bare but they're just starting to grow those leaves out again this spring, which is very, very cute. They're very, very soft as well. Lovely, lovely to see. Yeah, you can, if you ever see a bald cypress tree, if you go look at the ground below it, you can always see like all these dropped needles below as well. So those are all the dropped needles from last fall, the falls before that. But another really, really unique thing about this tree is that they have knees. All this funky stuff over here. So this is a tree that grows in a lot of swampy habitats uh, down south in the wild. They don't mind being in an area that's kind of more flooded and they're really, really uh, recognizable because they produce all these big lumpy knees. Now, these knees look really funky. They actually grow up from the roots underground and we're not really sure why they're there. There are a lot of different theories as to why bald cypress produces knees like this. Uh, one of the theories may be that it may help the tree to uh, maybe absorb oxygen from a low oxygen environment like a big flooded swampy area. 
except in some studies they actually removed the knees of some bulb cypresses and those trees actually seem to do just fine so uh, we're not really sure if that's the correct theory another theory would be maybe it helps to anchor uh, the tree in a uh, environment that's maybe not as stable because it's very very wet so you can even see on this tree all the knees are on the left hand side closer to where the water is on Arboretum Creek and on the right side there's not quite as many knees so that could be maybe why so maybe it'll help uh, anchor the tree to keep it stable but we're not 100% sure why this tree produces these funny looking knees although it does look really cool I think they are awesome now uh, for Arboretum Creek we do have some plants that we don't particularly want here as well and you can see all in the middle of the creek here we have uh, these little green plants and they are watercress and they're actually an invasive species. So these were actually originally brought to North America by European settlers. They're from Europe and they were brought here as a, a, a cultivar to uh, cultivate edible plants. But unfortunately, uh, they grew out of control. They're very, very invasive and they have invaded habitats like this. And invasive species like this can be very harmful to aquatic habitats because they could push out native species um, and alter the ecosystem. So that's not something that we particularly want and that's why we, want, we always got to be careful about what we're introducing to the environment. For sure, but you know what? There are other plants around here that we can have a look at as we're exploring the flora and fauna of our Redum Creek. So why don't we have a look on the other side of the bridge as well? Yeah, so maybe I'll pass it over to Jenny to talk to you guys about that. Hi, yeah, why don't we have a quick peek over the other side of the bridge to see what other plants we might find in this habitat. And you might be able to hear some birds singing in the background. It's a lovely day today. Our birds love water. Just have a drink or maybe a bath. It's also full of food for them. So you usually get lots of animals hanging around water systems like this. Yeah, but this is another plant that you may find around a lot of creeks and stuff. So this plant right here is red osier dogwood. And you can usually tell a dogwood is a dogwood because it has very distinctive leaves. If you have a close look at the leaves here, you can see it kind of has all these veins that point towards the tip instead of veins that go out towards the outer edge. And most dogwoods, except for alternate leaf dogwood, has opposite leaves. So you can see the branches and the leaves are opposite to each other on the stem or the branch instead of being alternate where you have one here and another one a little further up and another one a little further up they're always opposite to each other um, and that's pretty indicative of a dogwood and you can see somebody has been munching on the leaves as well having lots of native plants around our aquatic ecosystem means it attracts a lot of native animals as well that want to find some food so that's kind of cool yeah and there's of course a lot of different species of dogwoods that you'll find around. Uh, red osier dogwood is one of the more common species. They're named red osier dogwood because they have these nice lovely red uh, branches. So they're a very pretty plant in the winter. Um, but they're also very tolerant of flooding and very wet environments. So that's why it tends to do very well, you know, adjacent to a stream or a creek or in kind of really wet soil areas. So that's red osier dogwood here. We also have another plant right over here, so let's see if we can get to this one. My balance is so good today. Didn't even fall once. We're gonna stay on this side of the stream in case I fall though. That's fair. So this plant right here is marsh marigold. And we can't see them anymore. It's not here anymore. But earlier in the year, these guys have bright yellow flowers. Uh, they look almost a little bit like a big buttercup. There's nice oh. sunny flowers. And we have a big old butterfly right over here. I don't know if you can see it just landed. This is a morning cold butterfly. Awesome. One of the earliest butterflies we're going to see in the summer here in Ontario. They actually overwinter as adults. So they're one of the first ones to come out in the springtime. Yeah, it's true. A lot of different butterflies. Well, you know, monarchs are very famous for being a migratory 
species. Some other species um, overwinter as either eggs or maybe as pupa. So then in the spring, they have to take the time to emerge or grow into adults. But because morning cloaks uh, overwinter as adults they go into a dormant state usually under things like maybe a bark or somewhere where it's nice and sheltered uh, they start flying right away which is pretty awesome and they're called a morning cloak because they have that kind of nice black coloring with the white fringe around the edge so they look like they're in mourning um like they're maybe sad or something so that's why they're called the morning cloak butterfly which is kind of neat a nice little neat visitor yeah very fun find a little break from our marsh marigolds <laughs> Yeah, for sure. But the marsh marigold, we can't forget about the marsh marigold. These guys um, have a really bright yellow flower earlier on in the spring. And they're a really, really pretty plant to have around. So definitely something to look for in nice wetlands. In fact, their scientific name is Caltha um, palustris. And the genus Caltha actually is a reference to a Greek word meaning goblet for the shape of their flowers. Uh, it's shaped like a nice golden chalice or goblet. But the trick is marsh marigold is a native wildflower, but it can look very similar to another plant, another flower called lesser celandine, which is not a native species. That's actually an invasive species. So they can look very similar. They both have these kind of kidney shaped leaves and they both have these bright yellow flowers. Uh, but there are some tricks to kind of tell them apart. If you get them in the flowering season when the flowers are still out, uh, marsh marigold, their um, petals, I say petals um, kind of jokingly because they don't have true petals, they're actually sepals, uh, which are normally the green parts of the flower that enclose the petals in other flowers. But marsh marigold has sepals that are yellow and really round. Um, so those are what look like the petals in the flower to us. Whereas lesser sundine, they have true petals um, that are a little bit longer, less round than marsh marigold. They do have sepals underneath. So if you look underneath and there's green sepals, um, then that's a lesser celandine. Marsh marigold also tend to have less petals than less petals than lesser celandine. Um, and with lesser celandine, they have nodes on this stem. So if you see that um, on the stem then that's lesser celandine and not marsh marigold so this is marsh marigold here which is a native plant and we do want it around <laughs> now of course we could talk all day about the plants that this habitat supports you can probably see there is lots of that around but definitely in a habitat like this there's lots of animals around too so we definitely want to spend some time on that as well and you know when you look in the water it's a pretty small creek so maybe at first you don't see very much, especially later in the summer where the water level might be a little low. At first glance, it looks pretty empty. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna do a little bit of a pond study. And I'll show you guys just how to do that and you'll see that there's actually a ton of life in these waters. So let me make my way back over to your side. We'll see if she makes it without falling. Made it, perfect. Very impressed with myself today. But you don't need much to do a pond study. What we're going to do is we're going to use a basin. So any kind of container that holds water works. We like using actually a white bin because it um, has a nice background to view things on. It's a little easier to pick out things uh, against a white background. So we always tend to use a bit of a white bin and we always tend to use a little net. So just for dipping into the undergrowth and all the muck in the water where all those little critters are hiding. So step one of a pond study, you're gonna take your bin and you're gonna fill it with a little bit of water. So now you have a little bit of water. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna take our net and we're gonna kind of sweep it through the muck or undergrowth um, in the creek or whatever body of water that you're using. That's where all the animals tend to be hiding. And the trick of this is you don't want to scoop up mud with it because mud's going to kind of cloud the water in your bin, make it really hard to see. So we tend to, what we do is we scoop as much as we can um, and then we rinse off whatever's in our net in the water a little bit, try and get rid of the mud. So let's do that now. I'm scooping 
and it's really great to get all the debris at the bottom of the water because that's where a lot of the critters are hiding. So now that I've given everything I a good scoop at the bottom, I like to just rinse off a little bit in the water so I don't get that much mud in my scoop. And you could just do that by wiggling the nets back and forth in the water to help rinse off the mud. And then I just kind of dump it in my bin. And don't be afraid to get your hands in there to sift through things and look at what's around. Yeah, so usually at first glance it looks like there's not much around. But if you do this a couple times, you'll start to see that there's tons of tiny little critters and vertebrates in your bin. And then you can kind of figure out and have a little bit of a scavenger hunt to see what's what. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, already in one scoop I see uh, little things swimming around, even a snail and I think a wasp that's actually not supposed to be in there. So we'll help that guy out. We'll get him out of there. There you go, buddy. Just dry off a little bit. I do not think he meant to be in there. All right. So to save you guys uh, the time of watching us scooping and scooping over and over again to find all that good stuff in there, we've actually done uh, some scooping prior to this to find some of the amazing critters that live in this water. So maybe I'll pass it over to Jenny so uh, I can show you a little bit more of those critters. Yeah, so we have a pre-scoop bin for you yeah, guys. We already, we already got all the good stuff for you guys. Now for pond study as well, I really like using our Arboretum Biodiversity Sheets. Yeah, it's really neat. It has a lot of the common things you might find in a pond or a creek. Um, and they're labeled pictures, so it's easy to kind of figure out what you have. Yeah, so uh, University of Guelph Arboretum, we make these biodiversity sheets diversity sheets on all sorts of different topics right at, right now using pond life in your neighborhood we have ones on birds and insects and mushrooms and uh, sky and all sorts of different subjects so if you are interested in these you can find them on our website and order them there but for today we're using pond life in your neighborhood to kind of help me identify what I'm looking at and so why don't we come over onto our pre-scoop bin and we'll kind of take a look at what's there all right let's see what do we have here so at first glance it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of stuff going on but i promise there's lots and lots of tiny little critters hanging around here let's see if we could try and track some of those down i think one of the big show pieces of this bin is this guy right here snails they're always so popular yeah when we whenever we do pond studies with uh, little kids they are so excited about snails and i think for good reason snails are really really cool animals i think a little bit underappreciated but we've got a whole bunch of different snails in this bin and that one is the biggest one now if you take a look at the snail you can see that it has a shell on top and kind of a fleshy part underneath in fact, this uh, snail's body is made up of two parts. Uh, the first part is called a mantle. So that's the part outside of the body. Or sorry, that's the part inside of the shell. And that's what creates the shell. And the second part is called a foot. And that's the part of the snail's body that's outside of the shell. So that's what you're seeing there crawling around. So that's the foot. And the foot has a muscle uh, that, you know, kind of makes wave-like motions to help the snail move across different surfaces. Now, of course, for a snail like this, they don't really have a mouth like us to chew and they don't have mouth parts like insects to eat their food. They actually use a really special way for eating uh, that's different altogether. So they actually have what we call a radula, which is uh, kind of like a little conveyor belt inside of their jaw. It has lots and lots of rows of really tiny teeth and they'll use that to scrape food up and bring it to the back of their jaw to eat. So that's actually how they eat. And aquatic snails like this, uh, they are usually herbivores. So they'll eat a lot of organic matter in the water. A lot of times things like algae. Uh, but it's a really, really cool adaptation to have so they could eat all those things in the water without mouth parts that a lot of other animals have. And of course, you can see on our biodiversity sheet, let me find a snail here for you guys. Yeah, so little aquatic snail. Of course, we could use that sheet to help identify if I didn't know what I was looking at there. And you see it's got a nice a spirally shell. I think that's my favorite shape for a snail shell is that big tight spiral to a point there. Pretty and dapper. It's a pretty dapper guy. And we have lots of little ones and that big one as well. 
Little, little ones, tiny snails. But of course that snail shell is very important for protection. If that snail feels like a predator is coming to get it, and of course lots of different things would eat snails, like um, maybe even birds or sometimes fish. But if that snail feels threatened, it's gonna pull the, uh, the body, the squishy, soft, vulnerable body inside of its shell so that it could be a little bit safer. Now, what other things do we have crawling around here? We also have this guy. Oh, and this guy. There's a mosquito that's not quite in the water. Do you see the mosquito there on the yeah. side of the bin? Hi, buddy. Yeah, and inside the water, it's kind of hard to see because the mosquito larvae are really small, but there's lots and lots of mosquito larvae along with that mos adult mosquito in the water. And you can even find the mosquito larvae on the sheet as well. Yeah, let's have a quick peruse of the sheet. Yeah, so where is my mosquito larva? Mm, is it on oh, the here he is. Oh, so they're there funky it is. looking. Yeah, so they're a tiny, tiny little worm-like animal when they're larvae. So when they're in their kind of baby stage before they grow up to the adult uh, mosquitoes that we are used to seeing flying around. And they actually stay in the water. They have uh, gills to breathe and they actually are filter feeders so they'll hang out usually in the surface of the water and filter feed all sorts of uh, organic matter through the water and if something disturbs the water they feel threatened they're gonna wiggle away so a lot of times when you see them in the water when we're doing these pond studies they're really really wiggly in the water now of course when we are thinking about mosquitoes most people are not a huge fan they don't really like having mosquitoes around uh, but they're a really, really important part of our ecosystem. If we got rid of all mosquitoes, we would be in a lot of trouble. For example, in the water, they help clean the water. There's usually tons of mosquito larvae in the water, and that helps filter feed the, in the water and help clean the water a little bit. And they're also a really important food source for lots of things like insects and uh, maybe things like fish, and lots and lots of things eat them. And even more things eat them outside of the water. So when they are growing in the water as larvae, they get big enough to a point where they could come out of the water and molt into adult mosquitoes and they're gonna fly around and of course some species can bite us to drink the blood but only the females and that's because they need that kind of protein to help uh, produce eggs and young but the males they actually don't feed on um, blood at all they actually are pollinators so they feed on pollen and they help pollinate a lot of plants so they're really important in that regard but mosquitoes are a huge food source for a lot of animals especially birds and dragonflies and all sorts of things like that. So if we get, got rid of all the mosquitoes all together, we'd be in a huge amount of trouble. So mosquitoes are actually really, really important in our ecosystem. And I'm quite happy to see them in the water as well, because that means that all the other critters in there have a lot of food to eat. So that's really, really awesome. Now, what else can we see in here? Oh, we got this big guy running around too. Look at that. Can you run? Can you give us a little show? There you go. He's like, hi. Hi. So let's take a look at our sheet and figure out what he is. I think he looks a little bit like this guy. That's a pretty good match. Yeah, so he is an isopod. And at first glance, he looks a lot like a insect. But he's actually not an insect. So insects uh, can be differentiated from other animals because a lot of them, they have at some point in their life, six legs. So two, uh, so pairs of three pairs of two legs, as for a total of six legs. And if we were to count this little guy, he actually have five pairs of two legs, giving him a total of 10 legs. So that automatically uh, means he's out of the running for being an insect. He is not an insect. In fact, isopods are a crustacean. They're more closely related to lobsters and crabs than they are to insects. That means this guy you can kind of think of as maybe like your little backyard lobster, which is kind of cute. I like them a lot. <laughs> yeah, and you know, he is an aquatic species, so he lives in water, but if you've ever dug around or flipped logs um, in the forest as a child, you'll probably find that you've seen very similar 
looking um, insects or not insects, crustaceans as well. Uh, for example, things that we usually call potato bugs, or I've always called them potato bugs growing up. You can often find them in moist, damp earth um, under a log or something. And that's more of a terrestrial species, but closely related. All right, so I'm gonna bring my next guest out for you guys. We did catch him a little bit earlier. But take a look at this handsome guy. Oh, sorry, buddy. We're gonna release you in a second. We just wanna take a good look. Yeah, he's been sitting somewhere like we might as well show you guys and let him go as soon as possible. And he's <laughs> a very handsome fellow, but we can again take a look at our sheets and try and figure out what he is. So he is a type of frog and we actually identified him as a green frog. So you'll notice he's not quite as green as the picture in uh, our biodiversity sheet there. They do tend to be kind of variable, but you can recognize them as a green frog by his nice green upper lip here. And he's got a bit of a uh, fold or a line going down his back on both sides. And he's got kind of big tympanum, which is a circle-like thing right behind his eye. It acts kind of like their ear. <laughs> but a frog like this is a really cool critter to have around in our creek because they are a really good bioindicator. So these guys, they have very, very thin skin and their blood vessels are really, really close to their skin as well, really close to the surface of the skin. That means they can actually take in air and water through their skin. This makes them extra sensitive to things like pollution in the water because anything that are in the water that are pollutants, like maybe chemicals or from our fertilizer, nit nitrogenous waste or anything like that in the water that's not supposed to be there, they take that in through their skin and they're really, really affected by it. So they are a really, really good bioindicator. If you have lots of frogs around, it means your stream or creek is really good and healthy and the water is nice and clean in order for them to survive. But if there are lots of pollutants in the water, they may not be able to survive in the habitat and you wouldn't find a whole lot of frogs around so seeing seeing the sky is really really good and another thing i should mention is that snails are also a fantastic uh, bio indicator where did a snail friend go they, they move surprisingly fast he's right there in the corner but they're also really really sensitive to the quality of water as well they can be really sensitive to things like ph and um the alkalinity of the water as well and that can change with things like uh, climate change, for example, as the water gets warmer, uh, then sometimes the water can become more acidic. And that means that snails might not be able to survive in an environment like that. So seeing snails, we actually have a lot of snails in here, a lot of them tiny though. So seeing snails like this uh, is a really, really good sign that our Arboretum Creek is nice and healthy. All right, buddy, All right. we're gonna put you aside. We'll release you in a little bit. Yeah, but why don't we have another look at our bin? Because I don't think we're done exploring this bin. There's lots of critters in here. You know what? Probably one thing that stands out pretty easily is this big guy right here. So he's not actually on our sheep, but he was a cool find today. He is a crayfly larva. So crayfly larva, I can see if I can scoop him up for a closer look. Hey buddy, here we go. There you go. Crayfly larva also kind of always look like these big grub like things. I mean, they live in all sorts of different habitats. You know, you get some species which are aquatic. So like this one is, we found in Mark Creek, but some species may live uh, on a more terrestrial habitat, like in the soil or things like that. But you can usually distinguish cranefly larvae because they have these big kind of grub like bodies. They tend to be a little bit more on the translucent side. So if you have a close look at them, you can almost see kind of his gut on the inside, all those kind of darker lines in his body. His head, if you guys can see, this end right here, it's also partially retracted into his thorax. So he can kind of pull that further into his thorax instead of just having it stick out. Oh, and he's got big old jaws. <laughs> yep. 
Um, so these guys have nice big jaws on them and they eat a variety of things depending on the species. You have some species that are more the tritivores, so they may eat decaying debris. Um, you have some that are more predaceous, so they may eat other insects or invertebrates in the water. Um, and you have some that are kind of more kind of herbivorous, they'll chew away at the roots and plants that you see growing around. And they also tend to have what we call, um, I like to call it a breathing butt. <laughs> so they have kind of structures to breathe out of, out of the end of their abdomen and they tend to have kind of little fringe structures at the end of that too. So he's a bit of a funny looking guy and he doesn't look like this his whole life. As an adult, these guys um, become crane flies, so we said that a little earlier, being the larvae of a crane fly. So they go through a couple instars. And what an instar is, is the larvae molts into a bigger version of its larval self. Um, and after its fourth instar, it crawls out into the mud it buries itself and it pupates. And after it pupates, um, it emerges as an adult and a crane fly, it kind of looks like a big skinny long-legged mosquito if you've ever seen those guys around that's a crane fly and they're very very pretty I think they're a cool looking fly and some people don't like them the adult crane flies because they look like mosquitoes but they actually don't bite humans at all so they just fly around I believe they're pollinators so you eat uh, they fly around and eat pollen yeah. from flowers uh, but speaking of a big jawed invertebrate in here I see a couple other things Oh, there's a big guy over here. Yeah, so this guy, if you see him over here. So let me see if I can scoop him up for a closer look. Uh, He's saying, no, don't scoop me. We're gonna scoop you, buddy. We're just gonna have a closer look, don't worry. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if you guys can see him well there. Well, we can probably match him to something on our biodiversity sheet as well. Let's see. Is it on this side? Do we see anything that matches? Um, I think maybe on the other side. Here. Yeah, so that's a pretty good match. Yeah, so water tiger. So these guys are water tigers. Um, and what a water tiger is, it's basically the larval form of a predaceous diving beetle. Um, and they look nothing like their adult form, as is the case with a lot of insects. But if I put him back out here, you might be able to get a better look at the shape of his body. He has this kind of crescent-shaped body with kind of little hair-like structures at the end. But a big, big um, flat head and their head has big jaws attached to it. So these guys are called water tigers because they're such voracious hunters. They're amazing, amazing hunters. Um, and they have these big pinchers. What they do is when they're hunting, they'll kind of lie, hang on to maybe a piece of grass or plant root in the undergrowth. And they'll kind of wait and wait until something comes swimming by. Maybe another invertebrate. They've also been known to take things bigger than them. Something as big as maybe a tadpole. If the right prey item comes swimming by, they're gonna uh, kind of swoop out from wherever they're hanging out waiting and they're gonna grab their prey and bite down with those big pinchers and then they've got themselves a delicious meal. So they're amazing hunters, which is why they're called water tigers. Um, as an adult, even to predaceous diving beetle, they're also amazing hunters. And as an adult, they'll actually have hollow mandibles that they can actually inject prey with digestive juices to start digesting them before they've eaten kind of um, chewed them up, which is kind of neat. That's kind of how they eat as adults. And that's a few of the things we'll see here in the pond. Definitely if you do a pond study here, if you're ever out and about and having a fun time exploring nature, you definitely will be able to see lots of other things as well. That's not the end of it. Um, but I do actually have another kind of friend that we pre-caught as we were doing our pre-video pond study to find these guys. And I don't want to leave him out waiting for too long. So why don't I actually get our other last guest for you guys out to meet? Yeah, well, maybe just look at the critters here while we wait for her to get our last guest. But be careful, our last guest is very close to the opening of the net. We can see still lots of critters moving around. The crane fly larva still hanging out. Lots and lots of different things. 
And the creek looks pretty lovely today too. Tricky, I think our last guest may have a seat. Oh, that is very tricky, okay. <laughs> Just kidding guys, our last guest has escaped, but he was a dragonfly, um, which you'll definitely see around if you're out in a wet habitat like this. Uh, they always are kind of nice and kind of fast and big and zooming around, so you usually love big wet spaces, not only because there's lots of bugs hanging around wet spaces for them to eat, but because dragonflies, they actually, as a larva, live in the water. So the larval form of a dragonfly is what we call a dragonfly nymph. And they're kind of funny looking. They have these kind of stout bodies with big legs. We can actually probably show you a picture since we don't have the real thing with us today. But they look like this. So this weird little alien. And they, underwater, are amazing hunters as well. You know, we always think of dragonflies above land as being these amazing hunters, these insect hunters of the sky. But underwater, the nymphs are amazing as well. So they, as a nymph, have this big lower jaw. It's called a labium. And when they're catching things, what they do is they pump this jaw full of water. And then all the hydrostatic pressure pushes that jaw out and they can grab something and pull it back in. And certain species of dragonfly nymphs, um, big ones like the darners, they actually have pinchers at the end of the labium and they're known to eat things as big as vertebrates. So things like tadpoles or small fish they've been known to catch, which is pretty incredible. And as adults, you know, we always think of them because they're so elegant, such amazing flyers zipping through the air. But as a nymph, they're pretty good at swimming too, though it's a little less elegant. See, dragonfly nymphs, have very, uh, let's say, multifunctional butts. <laughs> so they breathe underwater with gills that are in their rectum. And when they want to move around, what they can do is instead of crawling around on their legs all the time, they can actually jet water out from their butt and scoot themselves along underwater. So that's pretty incredible. So they're this funky insect underwater and they'll kind of crawl around and eat and eat and get bigger and bigger. And finally, when they're big enough, ready to become adult, they'll kind of crawl out of the water, hang onto a nice stick or a branch, and bust out their old skin um, and become that nice, long, skinny, elegant dragonfly that you see usually sipping around. And definitely if you visit a habitat like this, you can almost always see them around, which is pretty awesome. Now, obviously, there's lots of different critters and plants that are so dependent on an ecosystem, on a water system just like this. And what we have to keep in mind is we can actually really um, affect an ecosystem like this too. There's a lot of different ways that humans affect water systems. You know, one can be things like littering. You know, if we have maybe a candy wrapper or something that we maybe accidentally toss into a river that can travel really far downstream and a lot of different animals can end up eating it, which is no good. We can also affect things with chemicals, right? So if we overuse things like pesticides or fertilizers, the runoff can go into the water and really affect a lot of those really sensitive creatures in there and also the plants around it too. Uh, things like climate change is a big problem as well, you know. Um, obviously, it's a very multifaceted, big, big concern. But as the climate changes, you know, it changes the water systems as well. A lot of water systems get more acidic or as they heat up, that's less hospitable for a lot of species. And that's no good too. But there's a positive to this too. Not only can we affect water systems and habitats like this negatively, but we can also affect them in a pretty positive way too. There's a lot of things that we can do right at home that can do a lot of good. So small things like reducing your water usage, you know, maybe take shorter showers or close that tap when you're brushing your teeth when you don't need the water right away. That can help the water system. Making sure that you don't overuse pesticides or fertilizers, reduce chemical runoff into waters. That can help the water system. Uh, don't litter. Something as easy as keeping your garbage with you until you can dispose of it properly. That's so important. can help so many different animals. And obviously, actually, one of the biggest things that we can do to help nature and not only water systems, but all sorts of habitats is what you guys are doing right now. You know, sitting down, learning more about them, getting excited about things we have around us. That's so important, I think, because 
the more that we know about the nature around us and more that we're excited and like the nature around us, the better off we are, the more people we have that want to protect this kind of habitat. And I think that's so important. So thank you guys definitely so much for joining us today on our little pond study and exploration of Arboretum Creek. And definitely if you have any questions for us, we'll be sticking around after this video to answer them. Yeah, all right, so this is Arboretum Creek. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And remember, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, and definitely thank you to the Two Rivers Festival as well for hosting this event. Yeah, bye.